one objective in not all but many films is to take the audience and put them inside the head of the central character, to make them think and feel the way that character does. There are many ways to do this, but one is through impressionistic filmmaking, using film form to show the world through that character's eyes. This is The Conversation, a Francis Ford Coppola film from 1974. If you haven't seen it, you really should. It's best known for its creative use of sound, and that's part of why I want to talk about it, but it also has so much more to offer in other areas. I want to look at this sequence in particular, where Harry Call, a paranoid surveillance expert, goes to the director's cavernous, strangely empty office to deliver the audio tapes, but discovers that the director is out of town. He's not here this afternoon. This sequence, while set fairly early in the film, and not nearly as audacious in its deviations from reality as many of the later scenes, lays out the groundwork to subconsciously hint to the audience that what we're seeing may not fully be reality. Call sits in the office, waiting for Harrison Ford's character, Martin Stett, to return. At a first glance, the mise-en-scene seems to simply show a tidy, well-furnished office space. However, when examined more carefully, it reveals itself to be a strange, dreamlike reflection of Call's preoccupation with both watching and being watched. He sits in a chair in the bottom right corner of the frame, while the rest of it is engulfed by dark-colored, confusing details. This small space is packed with six chairs. Shadows cascade across the floor. The composition of this room is an oppressive jungle of opposing lines across the frame. The cluttered vertical lines of the windows and chair legs intersect with the horizontal lines of the horizon line, the edge of the floor, and the desk. The interspersed diagonal lines of the shadows on the floor and the legs of the tripod in the window create a sense of chaos. Call cowers in the corner, bent over almost as if trying to protect himself from the surroundings. In the distant background, we see what appears to be a cityscape through the windows, but none of the buildings are complete. For whatever reason, this city appears to be made up of entirely construction sites, as if somehow unfinished. Everything beyond those windows is outside Call's perception and influence. Because we as the audience exist inside his mind, there is no information to fill that space, thus the scaffolding. Finally, the chairs closest to the camera, the blinds over the windows, and the raincoat Call himself is wearing are all at least partially transparent, each perpetuating the film's motif of looking through things, seeing and being seen. Okay, what about this? Let's go back to that first shot that opens up the sequence and signals the film's transition from depicting objective reality to depicting Call's psychological state. This long take scene in which Call sits on the bus. The soundtrack serenades us with the film's characteristic meandering piano melody, while the lights on the bus cut in and out, as if signaling the transition like the house lights in a theater. All details of the surrounding world fall away, leaving us only a close portrait of Call's face, the windows behind him and some occasional blurred lights that pass by outside. The medium close-up shot scale and shallow depth of field isolate the spectator trapping them in this close space. There might be other people on the bus, or it might be empty. There might not even be anyone outside the windows. It's not even immediately clear whether we're on a bus or a train. As it stops, we follow Call's mind by cutting back to the telephoto close-up of the couple from the start of the film. Next, we get a morning establishing shot of the building, followed by a long shot of the atrium. Strong leading lines point to the center of both shots. The atrium is cavernous, empty, dimly lit, and made predominantly out of cement. The camera pushes in at a glacial pace as Call waits to see the director. Both of these shots introduce the vast, imposing, and strangely empty feeling of the sequence. At the end of the previously discussed shot in the office, Call stands up and looks through the telescope out into the city. After a few seconds, Martin Stett returns to the office catching Call off guard. When he asks, what do you see? Call turns around, slightly startled. This seemingly innocuous detail perfectly encapsulates the fear that tortures Call at the end of the film. He invades other people's privacy for a living, but his own privacy is incredibly important to him, to the point that he sees a birthday card in his apartment as a threat. 
Would you like to take a guess Throughout the rest of the sequence, we see Call make his way through the office with a series of medium shots. After a tracking shot of him walking through the hall, he sees Mark, and we cut to a disorienting close-up of Mark's face. As Call continues to leave, Stead appears and stalks him down the hallway to the elevator. Throughout the rest of the sequence, a cacophony of strange internal diegetic sound, mixed with non-diegetic music, slowly rises on the soundtrack. It begins with what seems at first to be room tone, but it gets louder and louder. It becomes strangely distorted. The hum rises to a roar like a jet engine. As Call tries to escape the strange office, he becomes more and more paranoid. This deafening noise directly reflects this paranoia that's taking over his mind. As he leaves the office, he becomes increasingly convinced that something sinister is going on, and increasingly desperate to get out of there. The content, editing, sound, and mise-en-scene of this sequence reflect his subjective view of the situation. Watching this film for the first time, at this point it isn't entirely obvious that Call's view isn't reliable. Only in retrospect, after watching Call drive himself to relative insanity, does it become clear that this really began much earlier on in the film. It just wasn't so obvious. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, you can leave a like, or even subscribe if you want. Maybe I'll make some more videos like this in the future. Who knows?